Welcome to Paranormal Yakko. You are invited to join me, your host, Stan Mallow, each week when I interview a different guest of note in their respective field. The unexplained, the mysterious, the macabre, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena. We explore them all on Paranormal Yakker. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. My guest on today's show is distinguished science writer and communicator, editor and wordsmith, Chris Rutkowski. I'll be speaking with him about his book, Canada's UFOs Declassified. Chris Rutkowski, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. Thank you. Glad to be here. As everyone on planet Earth undoubtedly knows, unless they're living under a rock somewhere, UFOs have been front and center in the media and government agencies in recent months. What with folks who were once afraid to acknowledge what they know have come to the forefront. Uh, I'm curious to know, Chris, when did your interest in the UFO phenomena begin? Well, mine goes way, way back, Stan. I remember in high school, there was not only an astronomy club, there was a UFO club. This is in the 1970s. And I had joined that because there was a big flap of UFO reports uh, that were being uh, seen. And when I got into university, my professors in, in astronomy, uh, they hated the whole idea of UFOs. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. They thought people were silly. But the phone calls kept coming in. And uh, I thought I would get on my professor's good side. And, and I told them, why don't you give the phone messages or give me the phone itself? Because my uh, Carol, my study carol was right around the, the uh, hallway from their offices. And so I did. And I ended up talking to many, many people starting in the mid-1970s who had said that they had seen UFOs. I started investigating. And then by the end of that decade, I started uh, writing about it and, and giving presentations in public. What, Chris, do you feel has changed in society that people who were once reluctant to open up about the UFO encounters because they were fearful of the backlash and ridicule they'd receive are now coming out of the UFO closet, so to speak, and are openly talking about them? Well, I'm not entirely sure people have had that much of a stigma. Certainly some aspects of society, pilots, for example, are said to have been stigmatized by their employers, by the aerospace companies, if they ever go public. Certainly that probably is true in a in other areas. Yet, at the same time, there are many pilot reports that we still receive, and we have received over the years. In fact, uh, since the year 2000, something like 250 separate UFO reports were uh, uh, given to Transport Canada, and Transport Canada made note of it. Transport Canada is the Canadian equivalent of the FAA, which is, you know, in charge of everything that's seen in the sky. And I think people are also willing to talk about it because they're seeing it more and more on television and in, certainly in media. Uh, it's certainly something that is a conversation starter. One can hardly go to a dinner or a bar or something like that and bring up the topic of UFOs without people saying, you know, I have an uncle and I have a brother-in-law and then my sister saw something. And it just seems to be the type of thing that is great to get uh, conversations going. So I think certainly a little bit better now, but I say we've been getting many cases over the years anyways. Uh, what resources, Chris, do you use in compiling the data you've included in Canada's UFOs Declassified? Well, I've been working on that particular book for, for several years. I relied on uh, archival documents. Uh, I went to the uh, National Library of Canada, which is Library and Archives Canada, very similar to going to the Smithsonian or to the Library of Congress, uh, looking for UFO reports. And many of them are actually available online now. And Archives Canada have, have put a lot of them online. In fact, uh, about 9,000 separate documents, but I've got even more. And these include reports from Royal Canadian Mounted Police, from National Defence Military military personnel, from air traffic controllers, and from the co regular public, run-of-the-mill person, doctors, lawyers, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, all that. Everybody seems to have a, a report. So it relied heavily on actual documents. Now, this that differs from a lot of UFO books that are out now, which, you know, talk about the, the author's perspective and perhaps their speculation and their opinion, and they might cite a couple of cases here and there. But this book, Canada's UFOs Declassified, dependent and comes out of actual government documents documents, military, uh, Transport Canada pilot documents, and I actually reproduce uh, 40 to 50 of these documents within the book itself. So this is not speculation, sort of pie in the sky, or pardon the pun, I suppose. I'm not talking about things that might be or propulsion systems of how far it takes to, to get the Zeta Reticuli. These are actual reports that were filed in, by an official manner and investigated by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in some cases, by Defence Canada, and also by, you know, 
well, there's a, a couple of American cases. So we have cases uh, involving uh, the FBI. So there are many, many cases in here. And I would bet that most of people who are watching this right now are, have, are not at all familiar with some of these cases that are truly spectacular. Oh, while researching your book, Chris, uh, did you come across any stumbling blocks such as people in power who had the info you wanted would not give it to you or try to dissuade you from writing it? Or that was not the case? No, I'd have to say nobody uh, was uh, uh, really not enabling me. In fact, I received a lot of cooperation from Library and Archives Canada, for example, from some of the government departments. Of course, in, in Canada, as in the United States, there are documents that are classified and confidential that uh, you have to apply for special exemptions. Uh, and that would be, for example, if a, a UFO was seen by a pilot, for example, these days flying over Ukraine. The location, the method by which uh, the UFO was detected, the, the, the camera, the, the radar, even the, the pilot and uh, where he was going or she was going at the time, that would all be classified. And we rightly so wouldn't have any reason to be able to get the information on that. So there are cases like that, and they still exist, and uh, I wouldn't have been able to get those. But I've been able to, been privileged to receive Canadian government documents uh, since about uh, the late 1990s. And over that time, National Defense and uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, ha in fact, have cooperated very well in giving me documents that were confidential at one time and were later declassified or unclassified. But there are many documents that uh, that do attest to the fact that uh, objects and uh, in the sky and elsewhere have been in indeed seen and observed and detected by responsible individuals and people with very good observing capabilities. And that would be true anywhere in the world. Uh, has any Canadian province had more reported UFO sightings than the other? If so, which one? Well, you know, UFO reports are related to population. Back in the late 1980s, I began doing doing a, uh, a study called the Canadian UFO Survey. And every year I gather in all the UFO reports that are recorded in a given year. And I go through government records. I go through public records. I go through records from uh, UFO groups and things that are available online and, and also cases that are reported directly to me and my colleagues. Since 1989, we have more than 25,000 separate UFO reports in Canada. And they are broken down by population in that you can just imagine that a, a large metropolitan city where there's a lot of people will probably probably have more UFO reports simply by the nature of so many people around to see something than a small rural area with only maybe 50 people in a town. It's related to population, so it also means that the provinces with the largest populations will have that. But of course, most provinces, like states, the population is you know centered in small, relatively small cities. And so if there's a UFO report in the panhandle of Oklahoma, for example, you know that's well away from a city, and uh, that does skew the, the demographics a little bit. And yet there are some areas uh, in Canada, just like there are in the United States, that uh, seem to have more UFO reports than they should based entirely on population. And recently we were able to find that the eastern seaboard of Canada uh, seems to have more than other parts of Canada. And uh, there's a couple of spots on the west coast of Canada as well that seem to have more than they should. So there are some regions. We're not entirely sure what that means. It's the type of thing that we can continue to look at and study it in a scientific manner. Uh, your book, Chris, Chronicles for sure, UFO sightings throughout Canada. Is there any common denominator regarding the locations of where they were seen, such as them being sighted more in rural areas than cities and seen uh, during daylight hours versus the nighttime? The vast preponderance of UFO reports are generally in the evening uh, because most UFOs are simply lights in the sky. And for that, you need some dark skies. And so that would be the types that you would get more than anything else. Quite a considerable number are simply lights in the sky or, or structured objects that are seen in the night sky. Other stats that we can pull out are things like time of night. 11 o'clock at night seems to me the, the most common time to see a UFO. Uh, and there are similar shapes uh, of UFOs. The most common is simply a point, a point of source of light. The classic flying saucer shape was long gone, very rarely reported. But, uh, you know, the these are the types of pieces of information and pieces of data that can be recorded and they come from people sending in their emails uh, to us. They fill out forms on uh, on web pages from uh, various UFO organizations. And it gives us a broader idea of exactly what people are seeing, because I want to know what exactly is it that people are seeing and reporting.
reporting as UFOs, because that's what, what the bottom line is. How did the witnesses of UFOs describe what the crafts they saw look like? Did they look similar or were there differences on how they described what they saw? I know you had just mentioned about them not being a certain shape, but how, did it vary on how people described the shape of what they saw or were they pretty much in the same ballpark? The shapes of UFOs really run the gamut, everything from flying boxcars to the crosses and, and squiggles in the sky. But the vast majority, point sources, followed by spherical balls of light, larger than a point of light. And then after that, I know we did for a while have a period when there were more triangles than saucers. There are the occasional squares and uh, diffuse blobs, you know, just sort of patches of light in the sky are, are sometimes reported. So it's it's definitely not consistent. The, the kinds of UFOs that are reported very, very considerably. And that adds to the mystery because we can't simply come up with one neat packaged explanation for all of everything that UFOs are. Was there any sort of consensus on the part of those who reported seeing UFOs about how it affected them personally? What went through their minds when it happened? Was it disbelief? Was it fear? Did they think the world was ending, that alien beings were arriving, or were they just plain dumbfounded and froze? Was any of that included in the records you had gotten and looked at? I'd say those are grouped into three separate categories. There are those people who were just genuinely puzzled. They uh, saw something and it didn't seem to them to be a star or planet or plane and they wanted somebody to explain it for them. So they would uh, report it so they can get an explanation. Then there's those people who really thought that uh, they were seeing, like you mentioned, the second coming, the alien invasion. Seeing it to them really crystallized their belief that aliens existed and that they were going to be uh, contacted in one way or another. And then there's the, the third category, I suppose that they really felt a connection. They were fearful, their emotions were, were playing havoc with them, they had a high level of anxiety. We've had people seek counseling uh, because they were so upset by what they saw. But, you know, they really want to share their experience with someone who can listen to them. And I think that's the best thing that a, a UFO investigator can do is, is rather than investigate and interrogate, just simply listen, because sharing something from the heart is a, a way of really understanding what someone has experienced. Could you, Chris, share some of the many UFO sightings covered in your book? I'll focus on uh, some that the government itself believed were uh, were significant. In fact, there's a 25 or 26 page document called the uh, Robertson Briefing, not the Robertson Committee, but the Robertson Briefing, where Canada's defense minister, so just imagine the, uh, the commander-in-chief's minister of defense or the, the, the person in charge of defense in the United States, wanted to know what had been going on with regard to UFOs as, as a new minister came into power. And so they prepared a, an analysis and a slide presentation. This is back in 1967. And and they listed six cases out of several hundred that were unexplained. One of them was a case in which uh, an amateur prospector, Rockhound, was uh, exploring in the, the woods one day. And at uh, about lunchtime, for all intents and purposes, a Hollywood-style flying saucer came down and uh, landed on a flat rock ridge not too far from him. He walked up to it. He touched the side of it. His glove, his rubberized glove burned. And he heard some voices coming from inside a a little uh, doorway that had opened up. All of a sudden, a blast of hot gas came out of this thing uh, as it took off again, which set his clothes on fire, set fighters some leaves and pine needles and so forth. The thing took off. Now, this, this fellow eventually was treated in hospital, and the case was investigated by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and by uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force. There was radiation found at the site. There was a sort of a, a, a circular area uh, of debris that was located. This fellow had burns on his body that that uh, couldn't be explained. He went to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic was puzzled as to what had uh, occurred to him. And the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the, uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force both said that they had no explanation for what had occurred. That's just one of the cases that they presented to the Chief of Defense in Canada. As you undoubtedly know, Chris, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, former Canadian Minister of National Defense, who is now in spirit, may his soul rest in peace, made headlines worldwide when he became the first person of cabinet rank in the G8 group of countries to state unequivocally UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. i proud I had the privilege of interviewing him on Paranormal Yakker some years ago and know it was his hope that someone would follow in his footsteps. To your knowledge, Chris, is there anyone of Helia's stature in government, someone who believes in the existence of USO, who is currently doing that? 
Well, I think there's a, a couple of politicians in Canada who are taking up the mantle. There's a fellow named Larry McGuire who uh, publicly came out uh, just a matter of uh, a year or two ago saying that he believed that there is perhaps a public safety concern regarding UAP. M Mr. McGuire met with some of the notable figures in ufology right now, Louis Elizondo and, and others. So he's certainly been very vocal about it. I've met with him. He asked me to brief him on my work. He's certainly keeping track of this. I would note that Paul Hellyer, when he was in office um, in 1967, he said that he had seen no information about UFOs that were of any interest to him. And yet the case I just related to the, about the fellow being burned by the object and there was radiation found and investigated by a national defense, that occurred during his watch. Mr. Hellyer made no reference to that and found nothing of interest during the time he was in office. He left office in late 1967. After that point, he had no security clearance whatsoever. He really just learned about UFOs through various connections. And it's difficult to say where he found out some of the other information. But when he finally came public about uh, UFOs in uh, the mid-2000s, I suppose it was, uh, you know, he certainly did rattle some cages. Absolutely. And just for whatever it's worth, Department, he did share with me a number of uh, people, top level in the government, uh, who did share with him things they saw, uh, things they experienced related to the UFOs. And hopefully that will come out at some point in time. Um, I'm curious uh, if someone has an encounter with a UFO, who, Chris, do you suggest they report it to and how would they go about doing it? I actually have a post on my blog about this, about uh, where to report UFOs these days, because it's not very clear. At one time, there were a handful of UFO organizations, APRO, MUFON, NICAP, and the Center for UFO Studies, and maybe a few others, uh, where people could report them. In fact, the Center for UFO Studies made a point of having a little sticker on all the telephones in sheriff's offices across the United States so that uh, people could report UFOs to them. Most of those are gone with the exception of MUFON. MUFON still accepts UFO reports from all around the world, including Canada, and our uh, annual UFO survey includes MUFON reports. Pilots uh, in the United States, even though the FAA insists that it's not that interested, pilots can probably still make reports to the uh, FAA. In Canada, pilots are encouraged to report UFOs, and they're calling them UFOs, by the way, in Canada, not UAP, to Transport Canada, and there's a mechanism to, to do that. So I, I would still say it's a matter of contacting local authorities, but uh, there's some UFO organizations around that still want to hear about what you've seen. Should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy UFOs declassified and also learn about the other books you've authored, really great books? How do they go about doing that? There's several ways. The best way is to go to Amazon and look for this book, Canada's UFOs Declassified, Chris Averkowski. It's available on Amazon. That's the easiest way to find it. And if you go to Amazon, many of my other books are available. I actually have 10 out now on uh, UFOs and related subjects. And it's not just Canada. As a matter of fact, uh, most of my books are about UFOs all around the world. In fact, one is called The World of UFOs, which uh, documents UFO reports from every continent, including Antarctica. So there are many uh, good stories in there, and uh, I hope that uh, it's a good summer reading for you. Chris Ratowski, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. It was a pleasure yakking with you, and I look forward to interviewing again in the future about your other books. Thank you for being a wonderful guest. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. To be sure you're amongst the first to receive new interviews when they're released and to have access to previous ones, subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, all you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen. Bye.